culture in a, oh, sorry. I need to give AJ the signal. AJ, we're good to go. Can you mess it? Uh, what's the signal? Hi everyone, welcome to the first installation of Aquaculture Innovation Hour. Aquaculture Innovation Hour is a webinar series on aquaculture in entrepreneurship and innovation in Singapore and the region. Now, by now, most of you would have probably heard about like the 30 by 30 goal for Singapore, which is 30% of local food production by 2030. Uh, as you may have all seen by the supermarket shelves that have been cleared uh, due to the COVID-19 panic buying, food security is an issue at the back of every Singaporean's minds. Now, fish production has to form part of this 30% of local food production, but how exactly do we get there? Did we organize this series to encourage uh, more people in Singapore to think about the role of entrepreneurship and innovation in moving the aquaculture innovation forward so it can sustainably feed more people in Singapore and the world. My name is Ben and I'm the program coordinator at Hatch Blue and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Hatch Blue is the world's first sustainable aquaculture accelerator program and it was founded in 2019. To date, we have invested in over 30 startups and we find, scale and develop a disruptive aquaculture tech to make a global sustainable aquaculture industry. Today, I am very, very grateful to have our three panelists. First, uh, we have George, my boss. Uh, he founded Hatch uh, together with Wayne and Carson in 2018, and he's the current managing partner of Hatch. Uh, next, we have Ting Kai, or better known as Kai. He's the managing director at Ahua Kelong, a local fish farm which also has its own restaurant. And last but not least, we have Ronnie Tan. Ronnie Tan is very experienced in the field. He has over 30 years uh, of experience in Regal Springs Group as the executive director, and he's also the current uh, board member of Callista. Now, uh, I will take it to the, my panelists for today. Uh, George, could you help us with a quick self-introduction, uh, what you do, uh, how you got into this field, yeah, thanks, Ben, um, and warm welcome also from, from my end. Um, I'm, as Ben said, managing partner here at Hatch. I also started Hatch about three years ago, and um, we really set out uh, with a mission to, to support early stage innovation in the field. Um, so we, we ran our first accelerator program in 2018 in, in Norway, um, since then have um, also located to, to Singapore because Asia uh, is a super important region for aquaculture and we can maybe talk about that a little bit later. But basically, I, I came to Singapore quite frequently in 2018 and, and then we set up there in 2019 and last year ran a program that went all, ar all around the world, starting in, in Hawaii, going to Norway and then really spending a good Good amount of time in, in in Singapore and what we do is that we that we invest a little bit of money in these companies early on then we run a program Ronnie for example is a is a mentor to to uh, to the, some of those startups and we bring in a lot of expertise we bring in connection to industry to to investors um, to yeah to 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 talent and um, then we, we set these companies up for, for success. That's called an accelerator. We try to, to speed up their development and, and help them um, get into the aquaculture market or scale within the aquaculture market. And yeah, as Ben mentioned, we, uh, we've now invested over, uh, in over 30 companies. We raised our first fund of um, eight and a half million um, US dollars that we're, we're currently deploying and we're we are always looking for innovation um, globally in the aquaculture space, um, feed innovation, um, health, technology going on farms, and um, yeah, hope to hope to continue doing so. And um, I'm I'm glad to be here today um, because the um, aquaculture is, uh, seems quite a new field in 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 Singapore in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, and yeah, looking forward to today. All right. Thanks for that introduction, George. Uh, Kai, can we move on to you? Could you tell us uh, what you do at Ahua Kelong and uh, 
what the different entities are in Ahua Kelong. I understand there are, there's more than one farm and you also have a food establishment. Yeah, right. So uh, my name is Kai. Uh, I recently run uh, Ahua Kelong. We have uh, two farms in Singapore, one of the east, uh, one of the north. Um, basically, we started about six years ago where I decided that there was an opportunity that came about to work with a local farm in Singapore. And I said, um, let's uh, bridge this gap between the locals and local seafood. Hence, we opened up the first ever um, life and fresh seafood delivery direct to households. Um, that was the first we did in six years ago. Then subsequently, two years, three years down, uh, we decided that let's, uh, we really wanted to showcase and then the showcase local seafood as it is. And there wasn't any other uh, avenue to do it besides to, you know, supply to restaurants and get them to help to push that out. So we decided to open our own. We have a restaurant called Scale, which has been in operation for three years. Um, and I run that restaurant as well. So um, on the farm by day and in the restaurant by night. So that's basically my life right there. Except for some time when I think we maybe want to get married, you know. So uh, <laughs> that's basically what I do. I basically overall, I manage the whole operations on... Uh, anything that's um, going out on land from the farm, uh, on the farm itself, Ahua, in the name Ahua Kilo, the man himself will manage whatever it's, um, that's inbound. I'll manage whatever is outbound. And then uh, if you're dropping into a restaurant, you will definitely see me there, um, making sure that you're enjoying the produce that we create. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, and the restaurant is also a 90% uh, local produce restaurant where we only use um, mostly things that we get from the farm or wild caught. So besides farming, um, fishes like a Burmandi, pearl grouper, and uh, pomfret. We also catch wild things like your, um, go your what's this flower crabs. We have the uh XL clams. We call it. It's essentially your polymisoda expensa. That one. So we have the greenlit mussels and stuff. Yeah. So that's pretty much what we do. Amazing. Thank you for that, yeah. Kai. And where's this restaurant located? Where's Scale located? Oh, well, Scale is uh, now. We used to be in Haji Lane. We are now located at Eight Hamilton Road. We just shifted. Uh, and due to open fully for dining around July. As of now, we're just doing deliveries for takeaway. Amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm you. especially grateful for Kai, for all our viewers tuning in, because he just got uh, married an hour ago. And right after that, he took, he's taking an hour of the day that he got married to come and join us to talk about aquaculture. So thank you so much for that, Kai. No worries. And, and lastly, uh, Ronnie, thank you for joining us today. Uh, could you give us a brief self-introduction and uh, tell us a bit about what you currently do? Sure, my pleasure. I currently take on quite a few roles. Uh, the first one is serving on the advisory board of Callista. Callista is a startup, but it's actually come a, a long way since then. It produces single cell protein as a replacement for fish meal in aquaculture feeds. So uh, Callisto has recently gone into a joint venture with a large company called Adicio, uh, which is wholly owned by China Blue Star, a very large chemical company. And uh, we're going to produce or we're going to develop the first plant in China itself, uh, probably in the Sichuan province. The other role I take is a consultant for U.S. Grains Council, U.S. Grains um, promotes its products into the aquaculture feed area as well. Then I also consult for uh, BASF New Business. BASF is a very large uh, German company. And last but not least, I uh, mentor for Hatch, so it's a pleasure to be here as well. So as uh, Benedict mentioned, I used to be an executive at uh, Blue Archipelago, which is the largest integrated shrimp um, aquaculture company in Malaysia. I uh, was also the executive director and uh, board member of Regal Springs, which is the largest tilapia company in the world. So there we are. I'm not an entrepreneur. I actually uh, came through the, um, the corporate side of uh, the business. So just a different perspective on things. Thank you so much for that, Ronnie, as well. Uh, so we're all here today to start a conversation about aquaculture and uh, the panelists are also specially curated because George works with multiple entrepreneurs. Uh, Ronnie takes his experience from the industry side and Kai is an entrepreneur himself who hopefully will share with us later why he made the switch. So maybe, George, maybe you can start us off by explaining, are there any traits about aquaculture entrepreneurs that you've noticed over the years? And what has your experience been like working with aquaculture entrepreneurs? 
Yeah, so maybe first I have to clarify, we we mainly work with, um, or we don't work with farmers directly, so we don't invest in, in farms. So um, I, have, I have a lot of respect for what, what uh, Kai is doing and, and um, you know, doing the hard work of, of farming. The most entrepreneurs we work with, they have some sort of innovation that eventually go into the farms, um, but they are not, not farmers them, themselves. Um, Two main traits or two categories probably I see. One is more coming from the Western world, um, usually from some good universities. They have developed some sort of technology and want to enter into the aquaculture market. Um, they usually have a very good technical understanding, but they, they don't have a great understanding of the market. It's not that they come from a farming background or that... The, the you know the, the aquaculture market was was a customer before so uh, we work a lot with those type of um, startups help them understand the aquaculture market and and figure out where they where they should start and and you know where the bigger opportunities uh, lie and then the other type of uh, entrepreneur we usually see is is more directly from the market they have a great understanding of 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 their customer of the behavior of the customer the the pain points um, and and then they they try to solve that. Usually we like that type of entrepreneur quite a lot because I think it's extremely important in entrepreneurship to know your customer, understand the problem that you're trying to solve um, from your customer's perspective. And um, yeah, and then traits for for entrepreneurs. I think you know like a a positive attitude towards solving big challenges um the it's always some sort of uphill battle you 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 don't have many resources um in the beginning um the the odds are in, in a sense against you but if you if you if you can um succeed then there's also a, a great upside so i think the they are they're usually resilient. Um, I always say it's a roller coaster of up and downs, and um, you 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 have to stay stay motivated throughout. And I think uh, great leadership skill, um, diligent uh, work attitude, um, I think people skills are, are really important. Um, those are some of the traits I, I would say that um, that make a good entrepreneur. Thanks for that, George. Uh, that's that's interesting that you mentioned there are two different types. Because from our previous cohort, 50% of the founders actually did not come from an aquaculture background. They came from other fields of expertise and then they came into aquaculture because they realized that their innovation had an application uh, to the field. Now, uh, George, you mentioned something about an uphill battle and that need for resilience. Uh, Kai, can I ask you now, uh, how much does that statement resonate with you and what what was going through your mind when uh, you decided to start Ahua Kelong? Because uh, as you mentioned to us before we went live, uh, you came from a marketing background. Right. Uh, so how I came about to kind of jump over to Ahua Kelong back then, that was like about six-ish years ago, was I came across, um, through a uh, mutual friend, I came across Ahua himself. So Ahua is uh, back then also the, he was the original owner of two farms, one up north and one in the east, right? So then we were talking to each other and then we figured figure out that there was actually a lot of gaps. So at, pretty much every farmer has this issue. I can farm the fishes. We don't talk about whatever um, death rates or whatever first. Just say that output. We just talk about output, right? Pretty much every farmer has output issues in Singapore. So I figured that um, that shouldn't be a hard thing to do, right? So, and then um, when we did some research myself, I did some research myself and figured that there was actually no one um, a farm that's going direct to households. And then I thought, hey, this is an opportunity for me to kind of bridge this gap between locals and local seafood by sending um, whatever we have produced directly to the farm. Honestly, I'm somebody that's allergic to seafood, right? But when I, when I do try out this produce, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Why is it not reaching our shores and then um, sending to the locals themselves? Why are they not supporting them? Why are they still buying from the fish report and all that? Which these fishes take like, what, three days, two days to get here. Um, for us here, uh, our promise is that 12 hour mark. So the moment that fish is produced, it reaches you within that six to 12 hours. I say 12 hours just in case, but it's actually like four to five. Um, uh, then then we, we thought, Let's just let's give it a shot. So when we launched it, we went door to door. Pretty much the whole estate in Bedok, the east side, Bedok Yunos, 
um, Kembangan, everybody there has been like uh, door knocked by me, myself. So it, I took about three months to knock on every single door. Do you want to try out some fish? Uh, this is a local farm. Uh, we just process this morning, give it a shot, order us, and we'll send tomorrow. So then we did that. Um, that helped to build some marketing. I think uh, we had a lot of luck because uh, I think we knocked on someone that's like in the media or something. And then um, we got featured. So within a year, we got featured on every uh, mainstream media. And then that kind of blew us up. So for that first two years, I had a really, really big uh, big break in terms of all this uh, exposure. And then uh, we kind of um, tried moving into that direction. So I was not somebody that was from, when I say marketing, I was in uh, digital marketing. So I was in an agency that was um, uh, mainly selling uh, Google products, your search engine marketing, SEM, SEO, uh, things like that, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, and this kind of products. Um, so, so it was quite a big switch. In fact, whatever marketing that you see for the first three years of Aha Kilo was not done by me. I was managing the operations. I was delivering the fish to your house, going to your house to fillet the fish and stuff. That was what we did back then. Um, then uh, moving forward as we go on while uh, trying to push into the market, right? So now we're not even um, taking a big pie in that, that local kind of that market. Um we want to push that further. But while doing that, we realized that um, there's this, uh, this, this term, sustainability is a big issue here. What, what is the term sustainability? I figured through my six years, I'm not from, I don't have any like, you know, agriculture background, but I figured through my six years that um, everybody has a different um, set or mindset on sustainability. And then we want to work towards um, creating something that really uh, have that sustainability in there. So if, like for a layman, it's like, hey, uh, your fish locally farm? Oh, sustainable. But if I ask you guys, um, what is your definition of sustainability? You'll be a whole different level of things. So we want to go to a professional level. So recently now we're working with the government agency to get the uh, certification, the basic ones first, a good farming practice one, and then we can move up. Ideally, if I can get, if I can work towards getting certified by um, the, the bigger worldwide recognized agency that would be perfect, but that's a, there's a long way to go for local fish farms. Did I answer your Thank question? I'm sorry. I did yes, right. yes, yes, you did. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks for that, uh, Kai. Um, and I think, I think uh, the success of Ahua Kelong uh, is, is really a, a testament to all the six years that you've put in. But you mentioned this thing about sustainability. Uh, let, let's talk a bit more about that with Ronnie. Ronnie, you've worked for two really, really large entities, both Blue Archipelago and Regal Springs, and currently you work for Callista, whose uh, mandate is partially the sustainability it provides to fish meal as well, a very fundamental input of the aquaculture industry. Uh, how have you noticed uh, over the course of your career, Ronnie, uh, this interest in sustainability grow and develop? Well, um, I started in aquaculture more than 35 years ago. And in those days, most people focused on the ability to produce, the ability to close the cycle, the ability to increase your survival rate so that you can lower your cost of production. But it's interesting to compare two industries which started at about the same time. The shrimp industry in Asia started in the early 80s. Let's say in 1980, let's pick you know, a specific year. But at that time, the salmon industry started as well in Europe, but they've really taken very different paths. The shrimp industry in Asia focused so much on production and less on marketing and sustainability. While on the other hand, the salmon industry in Norway, let me just take a very specific example. It really concentrated so much on sustainability itself. And when you look at these two um, industries today, you have different images, you have very different, uh, let's say, perceptions by the market itself. So you go into a, let's say, either a European or a American supermarket, and when you mention Asian shrimp, they generally don't have such a good impression of uh, shrimp coming from Asia, thinking that, uh, number one, you may use fish meal in your feeds that has been perhaps caught with slave labor, etc. So things like this tend to give a little bit of a negative image. On the other hand, you look at salmon, you look at um, certain branding, 
like uh, Loch Dwart Salmon from Scotland. It has really gone into that area of sustainability, ensuring that it is produced sustainability. It can carry on, you know, for years to come. Uh, a good example, salmon itself, when it first started, it used to use in the region of about 35, 40% fish meal inclusion in the feed itself. Today, it's come down to easily 10 to 12%, you know, and um, this is the kind of sustainability they're talking about because they don't believe or rather the, um, let's say, the image itself, people don't believe that you should be farming or sorry, you should be feeding fish to fish, you should be feeding fish to human beings. So the use of fish meal um, should be reduced. But let's leave that uh, aside for the moment. You're, you're talking about um, Callista, and this is a replacement for fish meal. I don't want to promote the company as such, but it has difficulties in getting to this stage purely because when you want to introduce a new product um, to replace fish meal, fish meal has been the gold standard for most feed millers for well, since modern feed milling came about. And when you want to introduce a new product, you've got to make sure that this product can perform as well, but it can also at least um, be as expensive or as cheap or it would be better if it was slightly cheaper. And that's the part that's very difficult to start with because when you come up with a new product, you don't have economies of scale. The product tends to be a bit more expensive. So again, it's right now, you know, a chicken or egg situation. So that's where we are. Thanks for that, Ronnie. It's very interesting that you bring out that comparison between both the salmon and shrimp industry that started at the same time. And also thanks for raising that point about how new products, new innovations into the industry need to not only uh, meet the consumer perception, but also perform as a product and be competitive price-wise. Now, let me, let me push you a bit further. Uh, could you, uh, because you know the tilapia, uh, salmon and uh, shrimp industries so well, uh, have you noticed uh, any innovations uh, being adopted by big entities like Regal Springs or Blue Archipelago over the years. Uh, are, are there any examples that you could uh, share on? I think uh, Regal Springs is a very good example. Let me start off from its very beginning. Regal Springs started in 1987. It all started because um, the, um, the owner, the entrepreneur, found a very, uh, an eternal spring in central Java, which you know, had, you had 26 degree water right throughout the year without ever running dry. But the decision to farm tilapia was not taken lightly. And let me explain why. Tilapia at that time was very much a cheap fish. It was a subsistence fish, which people grew in backyards. It was for the family. It was for the neighbors. It was for the community. But to turn it into a cash crop and sell it into, uh, let's say, the US market, it requires image and marketing. Otherwise, it would take the root of um, Pangasius in Vietnam, which is basically like the cheapest fish you can find on a whitefish ladder. The, the whitefish ladder is, is very simple. If you take the most expensive fish per kilogram, you would be your, your flat fishes like turbot, place, you know, sole. Then comes your cod, maybe salmon after that. Right at the bottom, would be the Pengasus from Vietnam. Now, do you want to challenge and become the cheapest fish around? No, I think that's a race to the bottom. So even growing tilapia, it had to, re it required sustainability and branding. And that's where Regal Springs decided to work with um, the um, Aquaculture Stewardship Council, ASC, to develop, um, let's say, a method of farming that could be industrial and at the same time sustainable. Now, those are two very, very difficult things to do. You're taking tilapia from the backyard to a very large scale um, industrial methodology, a model, but you want it sustainable as well so that the Western consumers would be willing to buy it because there's a good story behind it. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much, Ronnie. 
Uh, now, at this point, we've talked about different challenges that the aquaculture industry faces. Uh, George, could you tell us a bit on the top two challenges that uh, countries in Southeast Asia um, will have to overcome in terms of aquaculture? Uh, top two. So I think one is that probably um, throughout the aquaculture industry in Southeast Asia, it's pretty fragmented. So it's, it's largely in small scale hand. Um, Regal Springs, for example, um, the company Ronnie mentioned, is one of the few, at least outside of China, that, that produce on a, for example, tilapia on a larger scale. Also in the shrimp industry, you would find 80% of the farmers um, or just being these, these small operations, um, not real businesses, um, but rather, you know, like individual farmers. Um, so I think th this makes it tough to, to coordinate, to, to, for example, decide to, to build a better brand, to um, appeal to the Western market where this shrimp often is sold to. Um, and it also, it also is tough for suppliers to, to bring in new innovation um, to, to those remote um, small, small farms. And then I think we, you know, that I might be a bit biased there, but I think also the, um, the, the challenge, I mean, it's a lot of those farmers then individually fa face a lot of challenges because they don't have these economies of scale and they are reliant on the, on the feed companies. Um, they can, they can determine the, the prices. So it's, it's that race to the bottom that, um, that uh, Ronnie mentioned is happening in quite a number of industries, but maybe more, um, more general, if you're an entrepreneur and you're targeting um, either the disease control on, on farm or you're targeting uh, feed and feed efficiency, I think these are constant issues. Feed is by far the, uh, the, the most important cost uh, in, in, in farming and, and um, diseases often kill, uh, can kill a lot of stock and, and yeah, therefore are, are a big risk to, to farming operations. Thanks for that, George. Uh, now, Kai, uh, in, maybe let's start from your own farm. What are like the biggest operational challenges that you face? Do any of the challenges that George mentioned uh, resonate with you in terms of both uh, fish mortality and the cost of feed? Yeah, th these two things are one of the main, uh, main costs that we have on the farm, um, besides your manpower and whatnot. But any, anything to do with the... Uh, the produce itself, like your feeds and the mortality rate. The mortality rate, rate is really, really crazy uh, in local waters to the point that when I first started, I'm like, why the hell are we still doing this? Why haven't we stopped it yet? Um, and, um, and I realized that throughout this six years that I've been in business, um, there are people who are trying to create um, new technology to kind of reduce that mortality rate, be it by putting everything on the surface because land is expensive. We're on the sea, but we push everything up and then we filter the seawater um that works as well but then to get there there's that cost involved to begin with we're talking like a uh, hundred twenty thousand dollars um, to kick off which people like us when we first start off we do not have um so we have to work with something else like um we have we have seen red tide here in singapore um uh, there's a couple of names that they've given it red tide um flash fire, I don't know, there's a lot of weird names that the news has given it, but basically this thing, when it happens, it happens throughout uh, year on year in during Chinese New Year period. So that's when every farmer in Singapore, it's, uh, they, they're wary of that period. So to, to do it, to be, to kind of curb mortality in things that we can foresee is easy. Like, okay, Chinese New Year is coming, we need to protect our crops, how do we do that? Um, use a canvas net then let's uh, you know keep it circulated within the waters that we uh, we control ourselves instead of using open water uh, that kind of stuff uh, but other than that throughout the year day to day we see um, fishes die here and there so my mistake as when I started six years ago was I did not I only focus on selling output I need to move the fish I need to move the fish so I can generate revenue to, to, to think of new ideas to how to uh, improve on the farming side right so I focus on that but I failed to um, monitor all my, my mortality rates. I failed to see why they were dying, how they were dying. Uh, was it like too many fishes in one net, blah, blah, blah. Because as I mentioned, right, I, w I wasn't from an uh, agricultural background. So I had to figure all these things out. Um, 
Then when we really dig into the numbers um, day to day, we realized there were different timings where they were dying at. Um, uh, they, there were different timings they were dying at. They were at different temperatures. They were kind of dying at that time. Um, the feet, regarding the feed side, we feed them quite consistently. So uh, that shouldn't be much of an issue other than um, the temperature that they were in. Uh, if there's no rain, how many fish die? We have that kind of figures. But then the next step is, the next question is, so what do we do with that numbers? Um, uh, so I decided to try and talk to, we have a few like um, scientific agencies around who are luckily more than willing to give us help without charging us one arm and a leg, you know? So uh, I've been asking them on this uh, advice and then we're trying to see whether we can come up with a system where we can monitor these things. Government gives us monitoring systems, but that's not enough. Yeah. Then uh, regarding the feeds, right? Uh, the feeds are just yeah. feeds. I mean, not that, I mean, because we in Singapore, right? There are only that a uh, couple of uh, type of feeds that we are approved to use, and then we stick to that. The courses are true across the board are pretty much the same. Um, there's there's no other way about it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, Kai. Um, yep. Now, just to push you a bit further, we opened this conversation talking about thirty by thirty. Uh, yeah. And you, you've, you've spoken before for some articles, but I'll ask you here again, what do you think uh, it will take for us to increase local fish production in Singapore? Look, I, I don't think the problem here is with the production. Um, we've seen a lot of farms suddenly spawn out when this 30-30 hit. We've seen um, those mass production ones, those um, portable container ones, you know, the one where you, know, you, you, you ship stuff in, they, they, they decided to farm fish in there. Those will up your production like crazy. For me, it's not so much. I can produce, no problem. I just need to get the fingerlings, fingerlings in. I can grow them in whatever space that I have. But the question here is, um, do we have output? Let's just say there's zero mortality, nothing dies. I farm you know, up to maybe 100 tons of fish. Who do I sell it to then? Um, who in Singapore is going to buy 100 tons of fish from me across, I don't know, a year or two years until I recycle, like the cycle, you know, it continues, right? And there are, from my count, 80, 80 over, at least 90 farms floating around Singapore, right? So if each farm were to have 100 tons of fish um, available at any one point in time, a Singapore population would not be able to sustain that. I mean, um, the locals are not that open to supporting this aspect the local produce right so when gov when people say you know we need to do 30 by 30 i'm gonna say without the proper marketing um and directional approach right you will never get there you can have 30 um tons i mean um by 30 30 and you have you can have that volume but nobody's buying them nobody is like consuming them there will be that production rate but it will not move. This is my opinion la, thus far. So I've been trying to push for uh, marketing operatives to um, spread a word, um, more educational advice to the public about how or what does the local farms do? Why is it better for you? Why is it fresher for you? And things like that. Yeah. Thanks, Kai. That's very interesting that... Um, uh, ben, it, yeah. sorry, Ben. Can I just interrupt? I'd like to add something to what Kai Definitely, says because please. what Kai said was very important. When... We when we first started the Shrimp Farm Blue Archipelago, we had to figure out what was the maximum amount of shrimp that we could harvest every day without destroying the market. Because normally everyone says that, you know, you can uh, produce, let's say, for example, 5,000 tons of uh, shrimp per year. And your market per year could be in the region of about 100,000 tons. So you wouldn't destroy the market, you wouldn't spoil the market. But that is not the critical factor. The critical factor is actually how much shrimp you harvest every day. And in Malaysia, we found out that if we were to harvest 15 tons per day, all the brokers who were buying from us could easily take the volume. But if we increase it to 20, the price will fall because they cannot push it out. So that is the critical number. So what was fortunate was that we had a processing plant. So if we had a harvest of more than 20 tons per day, we only put out 15 tons into the local market. The other 15 tons, we channel it into the processing plants so that we don't cause a turmoil in the market itself. Because if the price falls, 
number one, we will suffer, but it really creates a turmoil for everybody as well. You don't really want a situation whereby you're fluctuating prices up one day, down the other. Um, supermarkets find it very difficult to buy from you as well because they don't like fluctuations. They want a standard price. If you can give it to them for one month, they'll be very happy. So this is the critical factor. What is the carrying capacity of the market for a particular species on a daily basis, not for the whole year. Thanks for that, Ronnie. Uh, it's very interesting that now we're getting more into the uh, economics uh, and the perception, the perception of the public, how much they want to consume, which then in turn feeds into the economics of how much they will actually buy uh, on a daily, monthly, yearly basis. Um, we are going which goes back to our earlier conversation about not just performance and price, but also perception, these three things that play into uh, growing the amount of production. Now, we're going to shift gears a bit. I will ask uh, one final question before we go into our Q&A section. Thank you, everyone, who has been asking all your questions. Uh, we will do our very best to answer them. Uh, so if to all the panelists here today, if you could start an aquaculture startup right now, what would it be? I will give you like the, the seed funding you need. You can put together your dream team of scientists and, and technology experts, but what would it be? Uh, anyone can start first. Let's go with George. Uh, it, it's tough for me to judge because we already invested in more than 30 and you know, like a lot of the, the ideas, I think there are a, a bunch of really good things in there. So new senses really made for aquaculture, you know, like not made for water quality management, you know, optimized for the cost that we need in aquaculture, biomass estimation, you know, seeing under the surface, knowing what's not, uh, what's going on, um, farm management, optimizing the, the, the efficiency of a farm, the resource, um, usage. I know Ben, that's not answering, um, your, your question. I think if 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 I would start something though, I would probably still go for for feed ingredients. It's a tough nut to crack. Uh, Ronnie knows uh, how difficult it is to scale these ingredients up. Um, he spoke about that earlier, but I think the the impact on the environment, um, if done right, can be can be very positive. If we replace some of these inputs right now that are either caught in 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 the ocean or farmed in Brazil, um, you know where there was rainforest before, I think that's a very noble um, challenge to 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 try and find replacements for that and 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 scale them up. Thanks for that, George. Uh, now, Ronnie, what would what would you start if you could have your dream team? Let me answer this question in a totally different way. All right. Um, in aquaculture today, we do have opportunities, all right, which arises from problems that industry faces. In um, April last year, I was invited as a guest lecturer to my uh, alma mater, Stirling University in Scotland. The question they asked me is that in Asia, what are the weaknesses and hence opportunities for research in the aquaculture industry? So what I presented to them was um, two species, the shrimp and the tilapia, because these are the areas that you know I know better than others. So I went through different segments of the supply chain for them, ranging from genetics to the hatchery, nursery, the farming itself, the feed, um, then processing and distribution. If you go down that supply chain, you will find the bottlenecks or the critical factors required to, which prevents people from moving further than where they are today. So let me just take an example of shrimp. Um, today, the biggest problem is really disease. And because the shrimp has a very primitive immune system, offering therapy is nearly an impossible, an impossible route because once the shrimp falls sick, it doesn't eat, then you don't have a mode of delivery of your therapy or the medicine. So we have to look at prophylaxis itself. But in prophylaxis, um, the, the building up immunity in a shrimp is not sort of like, you know, it's not that easy, it's not a definite yes or no. 
So we looked at also genetics, how we could build robust shrimp from genetic selection itself. So it's looking through this sort of segments in the supply chain whereby you, is like HACCP. I think that's the best way for me to, to explain. What is the critical point of control that limits that particular segment from moving it on to the next one? Okay. So in disease, genetics is one way of doing it. Um, let, me, let me throw another example when it comes to uh, tilapia. Tilapia actually faces a uh, slight sort of um, hitch. I'm not sure whether people realize this, but male tilapia grow much faster than female tilapia. So everybody wants a monosex male tilapia. But today, the only way to get it is by using um, uh, hormones or methyl testosterone. It is approved by WHO, but still, when you try to sell a tilapia, the US market accepts it, but the British supermarket does not. It's a question of perception. It's a question of you know whether they consider it safe or not. Now, think of a way of um, producing monosex tilapia, male, by bypassing or rather don't go through the hormone uh, route. That's an area of um, opportunity research as well. And I think that um, any entrepreneur should, should be looking at these kind of things. So what I'm trying to say here, finally, is the, the problems of the industry today provides opportunities for startups. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Ronnie. And lastly, Kai, yourself? For me, if, if you give me, like, uh, like you mentioned earlier, if you give me everything that I could have, I could want expertise, knowledge, money, limitless funds, honestly, I'll go back to do what I did, but I'll merge all the farms that I can see with sight together. And then I will farm like, you know, 10 types of species. I'll try to re r and like, how, how do I get um, the red snapper to survive in these waters and I'll continue farming them? Because the problem here we have uh, through the year is that two out of the six years is actually, I don't have a sustainable um, list of customers that buy from me through the year. They buy from me this year for three months, then they disappear for a year and they come back a year later because of my uh, lack of um, variety. So I would farm, if I have, I calculated, if I had uh, nine to 11 species of fish, this customer could be my regular through the year for the whole year. So if I had whatever resources that you said that I could have, I would go back to farming as well six years ago, but do everything better. Um, you know, the structure, the, the, the placements of nets, um, how we farm, what we farm, how we've been doing things, the research and development phase. I'll kick these things off uh, much better than I did now because now I'm struggling to like, you know, catch up. So it's crazy. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Kai. That, that was great. Um, now let's go into our Q&As. Uh, we have a couple of questions to go through. So uh, the first question is for Kai again from Lucas Chu. Uh, what was the reaction you got when you asked residents if they wanted to try fish in general? Were they receptive? Yeah, so typically when you go out to knock on people's door at like 2, 3 a.m. or uh, 2, 3 p.m., you typically don't see the homeowners, to be honest. So um, I honestly, I'm very thankful to the helpers that were at home that day because they entertained me. They like, don't worry, I'll tell sir, I'll tell ma'am. And they brought that flyer back. And then you'd be surprised that night, the, their employers uh, actually called up and, look, look, dude, what's this? What flyer do you drop off for us? So um, they were surprised that, if I, if I want to, so if I did met them, they would say, if I wanted seafood, I have, I'll go to my regular wet market. But I'm like, um, okay, have you ever tried fish that are processed same day and delivered to you directly? They're like, no. Okay, give me a shot. If you don't like it, full refund, no problem. Try me out for the first time. Then we'll take it from there. And then it kind of worked out. I was actually a bit pissed off really loud because, right, you know, people were rejecting. I'm like, okay, don't worry. You try it. You don't like it, refund. And, you know, that worked. You know, everybody tried it. They loved it. And then this guy introduced that guy. That guy introduced that guy. And then it just kind of went out from there. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Really nice that the direct marketing paid off. And yeah, now, we always thought like, you know, you need to you know, pay, pay money to advertise. I, I always felt that if you're sincere enough, if you're willing to pull in the hard work in the beginning, um, not just, you no know, let's pay this marketing agency 5000 10000 a month to, to throw your things out. Um, it, it wouldn't work. You got to have your name pretty much out there a little bit, some sort of um, 
so that people kind of have uh, you have uh, testimonials there already for you people who have already tried and then when these other people that see your marketing question it these guys will step in for you yeah so i've always feel to start off you gotta have hands on you gotta push put in the the blood sweat and tears first before throwing money out to actually uh, market things thanks kai that sounds a lot like the perseverance that george was saying that he saw in entrepreneurs yeah, now and if i if yeah. i can jump in I, I think you know okay everyone you know all the entrepreneurs we work with definitely could also learn from from that i think that's that's exactly the entrepreneurial spirit going there knocking doors being close to your customers learning learning about them realizing you know that time of the day you won't even meet them you know understanding how you can market to them what they care about and I, I completely agree with with that approach. I think you you learn so much um, that you then much closer to your customer. Thanks, George. Uh, now Marie Tan has a question for Ronnie. Uh, how does single cell organism? How does this single cell organism help replace fish meal? Are you able to share more about this? Yes, I can. Uh, the single cell protein basically has a 71 to 72 percent crude protein level. If you look at feed ingredients today, um, fish meal tends to be the probably one of the most uh, protein dense ingredients you can use. You can easily get fish meal anywhere from 65 percent crude protein to um, even what they call super prime, which is 72 percent. And plant proteins just can't reach this kind of protein level. So it falls into what we call a, uh, the, the mid-tier protein uh, ingredients. So the single cell protein can do this. And um, we just need to find a way whereby we can replace fish meal in a diet um, to offer the same performance at the same cost. That's the difficult part today. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, now a question for maybe any panelists can take this up. Uh, I've seen two or three versions of this question, both from uh, Lin Wong and Rev Wu. Uh, when we talk about sustainability, why aren't more people in the industry looking at more nature-based solutions like integrated multi-trophic aquaculture practices? Uh, what is the resistance uh, and what are the challenges to adopting this practice? In short, um, IMTA is farming of multiple species together. It can be uh, fish together with uh, bivalves that help filter the water and then like the excess nutrients can go into farming of plants as well. And you kind of uh, use this ecosystem of sorts to reduce the wastewater that you need to treat. Um, yeah, so uh, Lin's and uh, Rev's question touches on that. Yep. Happy, happy to take that because we obviously look at a lot of business plans and a lot of companies that and that come to us often with an IMTA approach. Uh, I think there's some success stories out there and some um, some really great examples of that. But I think there there are a couple of challenges usually with it. One is market uh, market um, facing, so you produce uh, different species within one company that have very different cell cycle, um, very different markets to go to. You know, you, you, you harvest mussels versus harvesting uh, fish. Um, that's, that's, that's one challenge. Then it's the operational integration, having the talent, having the processes, I think, on site. And the, the third one is, is maybe more where this idea often came from, and that's like mimicking nature and doing what nature does. Um, with the with the idea that you you create uh, efficiencies um, so that the the waste is used again as nutrition for 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 example the bivalves or, or, or seaweed but often what we see is that the the, the savings the efficiency gains aren't that high and they are not um, offsetting the additional cost in in operations or, or setup costs so often it just makes more sense to put a seaweed um, farm or buy, you know mussel farm in the ideal location and not compromise on that and the same for the fish put it in the ideal location um, and not compromise on on that either um, so these are three reasons why I, I think what would probably limit the adoption, but there are niche markets and niche applications where I think it's working out very well. Nice. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, quick overview, George. 
Uh, now a question from Brian Lam. Uh, hi panel, uh, would like to know if there are any exciting food processing technologies that are transforming aquaculture. Uh, in short, maintaining freshness, lowering cost of production. I think Ronnie mentioned a bit of this uh, just now with the shrimp. Yeah. Um, I actually can, can think of one. I've seen a situation whereby you can use, you can actually fillet fish by using a water jet. Uh, I've seen this technology and, and it's, it looks promising, but let me just sort of take one step back. Filleting fish today is still a very manual labor job because no one can beat the filleting efficiency of an experienced person. When you bring a new person into the uh, processing plant and ask him to fillet a fish, he, we've got two problems. One is that he doesn't remove sufficient meat off the bones of the fish. So your filleting percentage can fall anywhere from about um, in, in tilapia, 33% down to maybe 35%, and you're losing then 2 to 3% of um, fish meat. The second problem is that at the, the best um, fish filleter I know can do five fish per minute of a one kilogram fish. And if you bring a uh, inexperienced person in, he can't even do one per minute. So this is the problem we have. And um, this new technology of uh, using a water jet um, to fillet fish looks promising. Thanks for that, Ronnie. Uh, Kai and George, if not, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is from Zu Zurida. Hi, Zurida. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Zurida is asking, during this pandemic, uh, did Kai ha have a problem uh, selling fresh fish compared to frozen or chilled fish? Uh, I noticed, this is Zurida, I noticed that in Singapore, producers usually market fresh fish. Is Kai looking at different marketing strategies? Question mark. Um, so if I got the cor question correctly, um, I think the question is asking me whether I'm doing any frozen produce. Is that or, right? Or is, do you find frozen being more competitive compared to right. fresh fish? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Oh, so I think I get the question. Okay, so during, so in Singapore, if you guys didn't know, right, during this um, lockdown, this uh, pandemic, lockdown period, phase one uh, on end prior, uh, there were suddenly, right, those people that were in the market for a long time, we had like like 100 over competitors out of nowhere. So there were people selling uh, life bidding, doing life bidding for mud crabs. Oh, check out my one kilo mud crab. This is going starting from $2. Come, bid, bid, bid. You know, there were these guys, there were the frozen guys that were like, they bought, they, they just mess by, I don't know, shitloads of seafood from I got no swear. They're like, oh, today this is going for uh, $10. Oh, we have that. $2. You'll come out later. Just wait for it. Then there's this guy who's a, it's a celebrity in his own right. This guy is a legend here now. He has like 60,000 views. This guy is called Wang Le. He's a, he's a seafood legend, right? So he can move like what a supermarket moves in a month in one single day. So, th so this, this guy suddenly appeared out of nowhere. They were frozen ones, they were fresh ones. But for me, we stick to, we still stick to what we do, which is fresh seafood, because that's what we've always been doing. Um, and then the promise is even greater now. But it, it's good for me that there's uh, competitors, because then there's comparison. Uh, of course, my revenue is not what it's expected to be. It actually dropped because of the competitors. Because um, compa um, competitors, there's a lot of people go for price point. Um, they want to try it. If I'm selling something at, $10, there's somebody selling it. $5, would you try it? You will, right? But then you realize, ah, price isn't everything. So um, we still keep to focus to our fresh produce. In fact, we don't do anything frozen. Uh, we've not done anything frozen in a course of six years. Um, the only thing we've done frozen is like, you know, your fish ota. Uh, we've done like sea cucumbers that are processed already and then frozen. This is for convenience sake. But other than that, our fresh produce, our um, like fillets, the fish, um, and uh, the whole fish, we don't freeze them. The, the more we process it in the morning and we move it out in the afternoon. This goes for home deliveries, restaurant supplies, and things like that. And and sorry, Ronnie, I want to meet your guy that can fill it in like uh, five in one minute because I can only do two in one minute. So I, I, I'm amazed. I, like, I, I want to meet this guy. I want to call him my master, Sifu, you know. I want to learn from this guy, man. Yeah, so to answer that question, I... Um, uh, we, we, we had a lot of competition, but we will not move uh, anywhere close to the frozen um, side as of yet because I don't see a need to. Um, the, the simple thing for me, the, previously there was a question on, you know, how to, I think, uh, pro like processors on, on producers. For me, uh, uh, something for all the users out there, 
uh, who are not maybe not familiar with seafood, anything that comes out from the sea should not be exposed to fresh water um, for maybe more than a minute or two. Uh, things will start to change their texture, the, the taste and stuff like that. You should only maybe soak it in to kind of get rid of the bacteria, the sea bacteria. Other than that, you shouldn't have it in uh, water, uh, fresh water for too long, even if you're defrosting. This is a, just a, I don't know, a quick tip. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, Kai. Um, yep. Another question for you is from KNK. Uh, how do Singapore farms remain price competitive or sustainable with uh, neighboring countries from the region who produce at a cheaper price? Um, given that operating cost is given that their operating cost is lower than Singapore's, so we don't uh, we don't compete uh, with price because we are never able to um, competition. To, let's say just given a. If we give it, uh, we compare it with a price from maybe one of the better farming sites in Malaysia, like Kukup, right? Um, Kukup is legend has it that uh, the fishes are the best there uh, farmed. Uh, I don't, I don't deny. I've tried from different areas. Kukup too, so far, so far for me is one of the better ones. Um, their fish are fantastic, but the only we can't fight with the price. So what do we do then? We go with quality. That's why I'll never keep anything overnight. So my promise is definitely um, fresh. Fresh produce, delivered your doorstep, um, six hours of, uh, from processing. When it reaches you, you can still see it, twitch and that kind of stuff. Um, but um, we will never ever fight because like manpower there, cost of uh, farming, your feeds and whatever, fish meals and stuff, they're way, way, way cheaper than ours. Uh, our stuff is, for example, if you pay a, a guy $1,000, it will cost you $300 in Malaysia. So then where do we stand? Um, we try to match the prices as much as we can but we're still about 20 to 30% higher than that of the markets. Not saying from the fishery ports, uh, but from the um, wet market sellers or the resellers. Yeah, so we don't, we don't fight with them on price at all because we will lose hands down. Um, that's what I've been trying to do past six years to kind of educate, not really educate the public, but to give them the heads up that um, we'll never be reach that price. But why you should still try us is to, because... Um, Number one, we're in Singapore borders. When I say local, uh, I mean like in, within Singapore borders. So I understand that like in America, right, when you're like, let's say you're in Texas and then you ship something to a neighboring uh, city, it's still local is in Texas, right? But in Singapore, even though we're small, I'm going to leave the, um, sorry, my dog is crazy. Uh, I'm going to leave the, that, that local aspect to just Singapore borders because that, that price range, the moment it crosses the border, just shoots um, up that much more. Why do you think so many um, fish uh, market suppliers are so damn rich? Because the markup is tremendous. Uh, I hope none of them are watching this, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so I hope I understand. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You know, when you go Thanks. to the fishery port, look out, man. There's your Ferrari, there's your, you know, your Z4. Everything is there. You want to look for cars, go for there, have a look at that. Maseratis are there. Have a look. I'm like driving a, a van. I'm like, oh, how did the guys they do it? I want to be like them. Yeah. All right. Thanks for sharing, uh, Kai. Uh, now, since we're talking about the region, Susie has a question for Ronnie, and it might be our last question because I'm mindful of time. Uh, hi, Ronnie. Do you see opportunities to reduce the need to import feed ingredients in uh, your region? I think that's very difficult. Um, let me just take Singapore first. It is obviously, uh, you know, it lacks land, so it's very difficult to... Um, grow any plant uh, proteins as feed ingredients. And even Malaysia, you think that Malaysia has a lot more land than Singapore, but most of the land is actually used for palm oil and, uh, and rubber, sorry, these two. And these have already taken so much that if you want to actually get more land for um, plant proteins, you actually have to start deforestation, which is a big no-no as well. So I don't think... Um, any of these countries within our region, Southeast Asia, have this ability. Um, and I think, again, this is where we need to find alternatives. Um, the single cell protein, which is produced very much like how you produce beer. It's in vats, it's in a factory, uh, it has a small footprint. So these are the possibilities, but you still have to import the feed ingredients. Thanks. Yeah, George, please. Anyone, if I can jump in here, I think the 
especially for Southeast Asia, um, I think there's a lot of um, potential for efficiency improvements. So take a, um, a company from our first cohort, Jala, they, they raised follow-on funding later, Indonesian team, and they just, they have um, sensors and they have a software that helps shrimp farmers manage their, uh, their farms better. And we see that the, the FCRs, for example, the feed conversion ratios Im improve. And even, you know, small improvement of going from 1.5 to 1.4 has a massive effect on, on how much feed is required to, to produce the same amount of output. And, and Ronnie was speaking about the salmon industry earlier. These guys are highly optimized. They are very efficient. They have vaccines. They, their feed conversion ratios are down. I think there, there's a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurs in Singapore, go into the region, improve the efficiency of the farming systems, and that will reduce and the resource needs um, of the entire industry. All right, thanks for that, George. Uh, mindful of time, it's 5 p.m. now. Uh, I know uh, some of you might have uh, follow-on engagements. I just wanna really, really thank, uh, firstly, my panelists for taking time out of their day to join us today to share their experiences with entrepreneurship and innovation in the aquaculture sector. And also to you, the audience, to everyone tuning in, uh, thank you for joining us. Our next webinar, because uh, this is a series, will be on 17th July as uh, the election period will be taking up the following weeks. Uh, that will be all for today. Please, in order to find out about the next webinar, please like, follow our page, and to learn more about Hatch, uh, please go on to our website and check out our YouTube page. Uh, that will be all for today. Thanks, guys. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much for joining, everyone. Nice to meet you guys. Very nice yeah. to meet you, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you. Have a great day.